ora, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to The World of Words Goes Digital. He kōrero, mati heko o te ao. World of Words Goes Digital celebrates Aotearoa's authors, comedians, musicians and poets who share words of wisdom, inspiration, personal challenges and journeys, culminating in a series of rich and diverse conversations. No mai, haere mai. A very warm welcome to WOMAD New Zealand's World of Words online series supported by Creative New Zealand. I'm Suzette Goldsmith and it's my privilege and very great pleasure to be interviewing writer, teacher and all-round advocate of writers and writing, Paula Morris. Paula is an award-winning and prolific novelist, essayist, short fiction writer, writer of books for children and young adults and anthology editor. She is a mentor and Papa Papatupu Māori writing incubator, New Zealand Society of Authors mentor program and has been a judge for several writing competitions. Paula holds degrees from universities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the UK and the United States and has taught creative writing at universities in New Orleans and Sheffield, England. And as well as festivals, schools, museums, conferences and writing centres all around the world. Associate Professor Paul Morris now teaches at Auckland University as a convener of the Masters in Creative Writing. She's appeared at festivals in Europe, South Africa, India, China, North America, Australia, the UK, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is quite exhausting, Paul. And has been awarded numerous residencies and fellowships in places such as Italy, Brussels, Latvia, and Denmark. Last year, she received the prestigious Catherine Mansfield Monton Fellowship and was appointed member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to literature. Kia ora, Paula, congratulations and welcome. Kia ora, thank you very much. Paula, I'd like to begin by referring to your personal essay on coming home, which was published, I think, 2015. The very first words in the essay are, I used to be afraid that I would never come home. And I wonder if now with the travel constraints we face with climate change and a pandemic, that you might in fact be afraid that you will never leave. How important is it for you personally and for writers in general to be able to travel widely? It's a really interesting question at this time. In fact, one that we've just been discussing at the university because there are the issues obviously of pandemics, also the issues of carbon footprints. And I mean, just you listing on my travel there, I was thinking, yeah, is that kind of life possible anymore? I mean, right now I was supposed to be overseas. I was supposed to be um, in Banff in Canada, uh, being a writer in residence there. I was supposed to be speaking at a conference in Finland, and then I was going to be teaching at the University of Iowa, which I do uh, every, well, almost every northern summer. And obviously all of those things are cancelled. Right. And for me, in a way, it's been both disappointing but also freedom because it's given me a lot more time for work, for my own work, rather than dashing about constantly. And I'm one of these people who obviously secretly enjoyed lockdown because I just got to stay home and not run around to, from meeting to appointments just to really be able to get some work done. So I don't know how things will work out really in the next year, two years, five years. I imagine I will travel again, but maybe it will be in a different way. So for longer stretches away and then longer stretches at home rather than going back and forth to things. My last overseas trip was to the Perth <laughs> Festival in January, I, in February rather. I got terribly, terribly sick there and spent the whole festival in my hotel room suffering and then came home and was was still sick here and that aspect of overseas travel which many people are familiar with um is not a very pleasant one i just i don't really know i'm i've never been good at planning ahead i have to tell you i've, I've never been able to imagine where i will be exactly in two years time or five years time and now i think i have even less of a clue uh, book festivals must be I imagine, affected by travel constraints. And for example, um, you're currently presenting the Auckland Writers' Festival uh, Winter Series, which I must say is absolutely wonderful. And also here you are, the guest on the WOMAD New Zealand series. 
Do you see that as perhaps becoming a temporary or even permanent feature of um, festival life? That's also an interesting question because, as you know, with WOMAD, the live event is very important. The idea of people coming together for a communal experience and, and live and in the moment, that face-to-face -face, um, aspect is really essential. It's part of our lives and part of our, of our happiness. But at the same time, there are possibilities offered by formats like this. Um, with the Auckland Writers Winter Festival series, it's a chance for some writers overseas who would not be able to come to New Zealand for various reasons, pre-COVID-19, because they have responsibilities that keep them away or they don't want to travel so far, can now take part and be part of a discussion and you know, be able to communicate directly with New Zealand viewers and readers. So I do see opportunities moving forward for more of this kind of thing. And for us as New Zealanders, I think um, it's a really interesting and important way of getting our voices out internationally as well. Because the sad truth is, um, for writers, very few of us get invited to Northern Hemisphere festivals because very few of us are published in the Northern Hemisphere so we're used to people coming here, but not necessarily the, the traffic being two way. And this is a really interesting way for us to talk to each other and to other people and to hear from other people um, in a way that's very accessible. Even the, the WOMAD and the Auckland Writers Festival, there would be some people who couldn't afford to go for whom it would be too big a journey. And now this is a way of taking part. Absolutely. There are huge advantages for us as viewers. As you say, we, we don't have to pay to go to the festivals. We don't even have to pay to, to, um, to have access. The, um, writers, the Your Writers Festival and this WOMAD one are free. It's wonderful. But there must be advantages and disadvantages for the writers and the promoters of writing. Yes, I mean, there is, there, there's still, as I said, there's still nothing quite like the face-to-face -face contact, the in-person engagement, the chance for individuals to be there in the room or, or you know, in the case of WOMAD, out on the hill, and, and also to be able to meet with the person individually afterwards, to get something signed, to have a conversation, and to be with other like-minded people rather than just alone in your house, perhaps, engaging, mm -hmm. but to be around that community. That's always going to be an essential part of human experience. So... And then from a, just a really selfish point of view, of course, from many New Zealand writers, like many New Zealand musicians and many New Zealand artists generally, are suffering because when festivals are cancelled, the fees we are paid to appear at festivals disappear. And all the money I was expecting to earn in June and July from all these various things I mentioned, not earning it. And it's, it, we're having to be a little bit more artful and desperate about how we earn our money. I'm just going to drink some coffee. I hope that's okay, Suzanne. Yeah, I, hope your, I, I hope your viewers won't mind. I'm sure they won't. Presumably, our book fears will be uh, affected as well. And, and with the flow-on effect, of course, to publishers, to booksellers, to, to writers and to readers. And I wonder if it means that we will be reading more online or more on our Kindles. Grief, I hope not. I've, I'm, personally, I'm so tired of screens. And for the Auckland Writers Festival Winter Series, I've had to read a lot of PDFs. I read them on my, um, my iPad because the physical book couldn't get to me during lockdown. And it's an exhausting way to read. I know some people really love it. That's fine. I find it exhausting. After being on my computer all day, I do not want to read on another screen. I really want a physical book in my hand. But I know that some people will. And, and certainly... I wouldn't have had access to many of those books were it not for being able to receive a PDF. So I do understand that, you know, yeah. that there are different demands and different needs and different crisis situations. I don't know what, what I really, you know, I'm just hopeless. At a, I mean, I, I think I save up all my imagining for my work. So when I think about the future, of book reading, I don't know. What I really do hope, I mean, as you say, there's an ecosystem of writers, publishers, booksellers, the whole trade, translators, editors. I really hope people do um, continue to support, particularly their local businesses, um, to support their local booksellers, to go out and buy books, to give them as gifts, 
because otherwise um, it's a very challenging time in an already challenging uh, situation for New Zealand writers and publishers and booksellers because our market is so small. We are already reading online, of course, and journals, for example, and one that springs to mind for me is The Three Lamps, which is one that you're um, very, very much associated with. And I wonder if you could tell us a little about it, how you set it up, why you set it up, and what the advantages are of this kind of publication. Well, there are two reasons for setting up The Three Lamps. One is because it drives me crazy, because I'm a pedant. <laughs> that people go around calling the three lamps, three lamps, and uh, all the Johnny come lately's in Ponsonby. Oh, we're going to three lamps. I grew up, uh, well, living with my grandparents on Ponsonby Road, and they, and everyone they knew called it the three lamps. So that's part of my evil plan with T3L, as we call it, the three lamps, to, to reinstate the definite article that has been stripped from it by the parvenus uh, that now live in Ponsonby. I'm just trying to obviously um, enrage some of your viewers. But the other reason was because we had a lot of really great creative work coming out of the University of Auckland from both graduates and undergraduates and alums, and I wanted to be able to showcase it. So yeah, we, every issue, we have two issues a year, and it's three lots of fiction, poetry, non-fiction, flash fiction, and so on. And again, we opted for web rather than print because I didn't want it just to be a couple of hundred people having access to it. I wanted to be able to um, promote things nationally and, and internationally. So for example, one of my former students, Melanie Kwang, has a fantastic essay um, up on the three lamps that she wrote as an undergraduate about growing up um, as part of the Taishanese community in Christchurch. Now that I've been able to send a link over the years, because it's probably been up for two years, Send it to numerous people, students, um, you know, new undergraduate students, I recommend they read it. Lots and lots of people have read it, both in New Zealand and overseas, in a way they just wouldn't if it was in a small circulation print journal that, you know, was knocking around in a couple of shops in Auckland. So for me, getting those voices out there is, is really important, and the internet allows us to do that. So, I mean, that to me is... That, that notion of accessibility and interaction and communication, that's all part of having uh, a web journal like The Three Lamps. Um, this year, we've, se we've seen the demise of the 27-year-old um, New Zealand Review of Books, and which is a journal dedicated to reviewing. Uh, we've also seen the Bauer um, stable of magazines close, which was another steady resource of um, book reviews. And more recently, Newspapers have started removing columns of book reviews, which is leaving a very big gap. What do you think the future holds for the craft of book reviewing? Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's been going down and down and down at people's access to reviews about New Zealand books to the point where people just don't know what's coming out. You know, they don't know because often I'll meet an avid reader who says, well, I, I always look at the Guardian books page, you know, or, you know, I find out what's coming out. But of course, that is not going to include anything from New Zealand. There are various uh, initiatives afoot right now because I'm part of um, an organization, an umbrella organization called the Coalition for Books, which um, has just received funding from Creative New Zealand to create a kind of a hub where not only will it run some book reviews, but it will let people know, here's what's coming out this week in New Zealand. Here are the books coming out. And by the way, over here and here and here are reviews. So you can go and check them out because places like the spin-off run reviews, Newsroom, and then also now the Academy of New Zealand Literature, which is another one of my initiatives, we have started running book reviews. We, we took the money we were going to spend on eBooks that go out to international festival directors and are used to support our publishers at book fairs. We took that money and with Creative New Zealand's uh, agreement, put it into reviewing um, the high quality reviews of New Zealand books that are coming out because we absolutely need that. And I think you'll see over the next six months in particular, a lot of new initiatives coming up around promoting New Zealand writers and books, interviews, reviews, features, Certainly that's what we do on the ANZL site, is really try to give content 
contemporary new books so people have a way of finding out what's coming out and what it is. Right. Fortunately, I mean, we've been talking about travel constraints, but fortunately your um, residency in France occurred last year, so you managed <laughs> to get that under your belt. And I know you had several um, projects that you were looking at, and I, I don't know the details of them, but I wonder if you could explain what they were, how you got on, and, and what we might see as a result. Yeah, I am very lucky that France was last year and not this year because I would have had to just come home. Um, that would have been really devastating. Uh, the current Mansfield Fellow, Sue Wooten, has not been able to go yet to France. Um, and we were supposed to be having a big celebration in there, there in uh, September to celebrate um, the anniversary of the, the Montom residency. And obviously that's had to be postponed, hopefully till next year. Um, I was working on several things when I was there, including a novel called Yellow Palace, which is set in uh, contemporary Europe with New Zealand main characters. And I have nearly finished that now. Thank you, lockdown. And um, hopefully <laughs> that will be coming out next year. I was also working on a play about Jean Rhys, who spent a very fateful summer before she was Jean Rhys, you know, when she still had her real name and was still living her very dubious life. Um, yeah, on the south of France in 1925. So I was able to do research for it there and elsewhere and um, get quite a lot of work done on that. But since I've been back, I've been working on, as you say, a couple of other projects, anthologies, um, a big one called Ko Aotearoa Tato, which is coming out with Otago University Press later this year, and uh, a really big anthology of celebrating new Asian voices in New Zealand's literature which I'm co-editing with Alison Wong, and that's coming out with Auckland University Press next year. So those two projects have been massive for me. And I've also been working in a collaboration with a photographer uh, on a book about uh, Robin Hyde uh, that will come out with Massey University Press later this year. It's an extended essay, a visual essay on, on the part of Haru, the photographer, and uh, an, an essay by me. That's been a really, really wonderful project. You're incredibly busy. And so I have a fire. Uh, it's too busy and it's too crazy and, yeah, too many irons in the fire. That's why part of me was relieved about not having to fly all around the place this year because it meant I could actually focus on work a bit more. But, yeah, I mean, there's always so many interesting projects to work on and, and hopefully this year and next I'll be finishing a lot of things, hopefully. <laughs> Oh, we're very pleased that you had time to talk to us today. We realise how busy you are. Um, just one other question about On Coming Home. Uh, you discussed nationality in it and what makes a New Zealand writer. And more recently, you've written in the spin-off about what it means to be a Māori writer. And you've criticised the bookshop habit of displaying New Zealand books on separate tables and also the library's tendency to categorise writers and shelve them according to their ethnicity. What is it about these issues that is so important to you and makes you rather cross? It's a thorny issue, this issue of how New Zealand writers are categorised and where they're shelved. I would be perfectly happy with a New Zealand table and if the books didn't live and die there, if they then, after their initial promotion, you know, got shelved in the appropriate area. So after our little day or week or month on the table, we end up, you know, if those of us who are novelists in general fiction. Um, but that's not really the case. And I think we always have a strange issue in New Zealand about how much we promote and support our own literature or are we marginalising and relegating it? So some people really do want to know what are the New Zealand books, what are the New Zealand books? And I certainly, I was in Unity Books in Auckland yesterday, I go and browse that table. But, um, but often, well, there are many bookshops that don't have very much representation of New Zealand literature at all, unfortunately. And often we have quite a, a short window of glory, as it were. It's, it's a, a difficult situation because we are in, in what academics call a minor English language literature. 
and we're competing. That's that's the, the term. It's hilarious, isn't it? We are competing with the books from the major markets of like the US, like the UK, um, who often have a lot more firepower behind them. They have a lot more advertising. They have a lot more media around them. And then they take up the majority of the shops. And New Zealand literature can often seem like the poor relation in our own bookshops. And it is a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue and one that we need to keep addressing in what, in all the time and thinking about. And I do think, to go back to what we were saying earlier, that simply getting more information out and promotion around the books that are coming out in New Zealand will address many of those issues. If you have people going to bookshops and saying, I want this book, I've read about it, then that will help. But it is a... We have many challenges, as I said, and while we have fantastic books coming out here, often not enough people know about them and not enough people even know about our award winners. And we have to do all we can to change that, which also relates to what you and I were talking about a little uh, time ago about the possibilities now of the internet. This year, because we couldn't have a, an in-person ceremony for the Ockham New Zealand Book Awards, where usually the finalists read, in the weeks leading up to it, finalists recorded themselves reading by Zoom and it went up on the YouTube channel. Well, we've already said we should do this every year. There's, you know, why not record people, you know, now that everyone's a bit more comfortable with the technology, recording themselves reading, put it up. And it means that people all over New Zealand who could not possibly come for the ceremony, they're not one of the five or 600 people coming for that have a chance to listen to the finalist reading and to think about their book. And then of course, people overseas can access it as well. So we have some, I suppose, some new ideas and new models coming out of lockdown that can supplement our live events going forward and really make us think about accessibility and reach and promotion of our New Zealand writers and New Zealand books. That term minor is very derogatory. We we consider ourselves to be major within our country. I know. Well, we're we're major in New Zealand, but <laughs> that the, that's the sad truth of things. I mean, to us, the other part of your question about nationalities and ethnicities for writers. I mean, you'll get some New Zealand writers who will say it doesn't matter that I'm a New Zealander. There's no such thing as New Zealand literature. These are academic, you know, um, categories, and that's true. That is true in one way, but in another way, of course, New Zealand literature exists because we need things coming out of our imaginations and our experiences. That doesn't mean that the books have to be set in New Zealand or be about New Zealanders, but they are coming out of the, uh, the imaginations and points of view of New Zealand writers, however you categorize those. They may be living overseas like Kirsty Gunn. They may have never left New Zealand. And that kind of um, that kind of output is enormously important to our own imaginative richness as a nation, our own cultural health. I do a lot of teaching in schools, um, going into teach writing with schools, and really try to emphasise to students of all ages how important it is to capture their own point of view in writing, because otherwise. If all the points of view we're reading are foreign, then we will have a very, uh, uh, well, then it's like, it's just colonialism, isn't it? We just, then we're just living in a, a perpetual colonial state where other people are deciding what we read and what we listen to and what we see. And we've addressed that in music before. We've addressed it to some extent in film and television. Uh, we can't neglect our, our national literature as well, our stories that, as I said, can travel the world, but somehow have roots here. Can I pick up on the point you make about teaching in schools? I know I've read of one that I think is very dear to your heart, and that was a stint that you did at Otahu uh, Intermediate School, which is a very poor area of Auckland. Um, I read what you wrote about it, and, and I was intrigued by it. I wonder if you could tell us what your aims were and how it went and what the results were at the end of that. Yes, I, I should, I do a lot of teaching in South Auckland and West Auckland where I'm from. I, I would hesitate to call them poor areas. I mean, I mean, it's oh. true that, that Otahu, 
or intermediate is a decile one school if that system is still in place i don't know i didn't grow up with that decile system but as most people seem to understand it um it's a wonderful school and i've taught in a number of wonderful schools in in south Auckland in particular i've just done a few in in west auckland i went to rutherford college myself and have done some um some things with them uh, the really important thing I think is always to get the message out about reading and writing and you see when you go to schools uh, kids with the most wonderful imaginations and potential and uh, you know all our children have them in New Zealand and this country belongs to all of them our cities belong to all of them and we can't be romantic about access to things because a lot of kids do not have the access to things that other other students have. They don't have the opportunities or possibilities. So, as I mean, the Book Council does this through its Writers in Schools program, and many of us, like my colleague Selena Marsh and I, do it by going into schools to to run writing classes and workshops. Um, I've also been involved with one through the Auckland Writers Festival, which does mentoring in schools. It is really important to get our young people reading and writing skills that will help them no matter what they do in life, just to be citizens and be part of, of culture, but also so that we don't lose those stories coming forward. We don't want to have a, a literature that's very generic and, and only from a certain group of society. We want to have a rich culture of many stories. So I, I always enjoy going to schools, though I have to say, um, they are petri dishes for illnesses. And last year, when I was doing a lot in schools in the second half of the year, I was sick constantly because it was hugging you and you're just getting sick. So now maybe I will have to wear masks when I go to schools or keep them all at arm's length. But it is very rewarding and very challenging. And you see firsthand that you start reading a story to kids and you capture their imaginations. And then that leads to writing games and exercises reading stories is so important for our children and that is the path into writing for many of them not saying sit there come up with an idea write it down make sure you're doing everything correctly but stimulating their imagination through through reading and, and listening to stories which write themselves i am i am very passionate about it but um yeah i am wary of of the illnesses they enjoy communicating to me as well as the love Paula, with your teaching, your writing, your mentoring, you're a very, very busy person. And we could talk about this for hours, but I think we're going to run out of time. So what's left for me is to say thank you so much. You're always a fabulous person to interview. I've got heaps more questions. We could keep going for another hour, I'm sure, but we can't. Um, so I do thank you very much. And I also thank the audience. Uh, we can't see you in our screen, but we know you will be there. And we do appreciate um, your your company. I need to thank also um, uh, WOMAD New Zealand, who have instigated this series, and also, of course, Creative New Zealand, who have supported it. So thank you to you all. Kakite Ano and These conversations are proudly presented by WOMAD New Zealand with the support of Creative New Zealand. Music